Not far off, it turns out. But what is lunatic fringe in one era can become mainstream, perhaps even commercially viable, in another. The destruction of the West Coast has been featured in numerous books and movies. Hollywood has, of course, excelled in creating doomsday myths, from the Antichrist continuing saga and countless unmemorable installments to total destruction in the Planet of the Apes franchise, The Day After Tomorrow, 2012, many, many more. Japanese filmmakers have been equally and famously preoccupied with mass destruction decades before the current disaster there. They even turned Edgar Cayce's prophecy about their country into a 1975 disaster movie called Tidal Wave, starring Lauren Green and a Japanese cast. It was imported to the U.S. by Roger Corman, of course. The uh, IMDb describes it this way. Racked by earthquakes and volcanoes, Japan is slowly sinking into the sea. A race against time and tide begins as Americans and Japanese work together to salvage some fraction of the disappearing Japan. Close, but they missed the nuclear angle. Contrary to the um, predictions we hear, Stanley Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove remains one of the most memorable doomsday movies. Its black humor and naturalistic performances by Peter Sellers, George C. Scott, Sterling Hayden, combined with a devastating premise that the end may come through a mixture of human error, a demented general, and flawed technology, an extinction-level bomb that can't be disarmed. There haven't been many stories based on Nostradamus' Eastern siege prophecy, although there certainly could be, but a number of films have adapted Casey's vision of an environmental upheaval. Oddly enough, <laughs> Charlton Heston appears in several usually as Cassandra or the Savior. In Planet of the Apes, he's an astronaut who returns to Earth only to find his civilization in ruins, apes in charge, and humans living below ground as scarred mutants who worship the bomb. In Omega Man, he's a disillusioned scientist who has survived biochemical war and spends his days exterminating book-burning mutants. He discovers an antidote to the plague, but only a handful of people are left to give humanity another chance. And then there's Soylent Green, a film that presents the slow road to environmental pollution and starvation. This time Heston is a policeman who eventually discovers that the masses have been hoodwinked into cannibalism. They're also so depressed that suicide parlors are big business. Most of Heston's vehicles were big-budget B-movies exploiting popular anxiety, but much less affecting than Dr. Strangelove or On the Beach. On the other hand, they definitely tapped into growing doubts about the future with a Dirty Harry-style response. But wait, now let's go back to Grover's Mill and see what's happening. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk and as long as I can see. The more state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain... Conferring with someone, can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those creatures know what that means, what anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A hump shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from that mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field caught up by the woods of fire. They're dashed in there, the automobiles are spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. After the end, ecologist George Stewart wrote his post-apocalypse novel, Earth Abides, in 1949. Before the atom bomb scare took hold, or the environmental seemed like something to really worry about.
But his story of civilization destroyed by an airborne disease took the idea of rebuilding afterward about as far as anyone. In this prescient book, the breakdown of man-made systems is traced in convincing detail, in counterpoint with a story of survival without machines, mass production, and ultimately most of what residents of developed countries now take for granted. Not many recent books or films are as optimistic about our prospects once humanity has gone through either its Big Bang or its long wheeze end game. In Margaret Atwood's multi-volume science fiction saga, for example, man-made environmental catastrophe and mass extinction in Oryx and Crake is followed in The Year of the Flood by marginal survival in a strange, mutated world. The optimism of Earth Abides about the ability of human beings to adapt may be the reason why it hasn't developed the cult following of more dystopian tales. The more dismal the forecast it seems, the more enthusiastic the following. What most of these stories and films have in common is a basic idea, the inevitability of radical cataclysmic change. Should we manage to get beyond annihilation, apocalypse, Armageddon, or whatever? They predict that we are very likely to enter a new, very dark age. Like most things, it's not a new idea. At the end of his life, J.B. Priestley, the British novelist who founded the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, contemplated such a future calling it a slithering down, he forecast that industrial civilization would one day come to an end. But even in a dark age, there is hope. The life of the planet will likely continue, and equilibrium can be reestablished in time. At least many of us continue to hope so. If the devastation is in total, maybe a new and better culture can emerge. So, the main question becomes not whether the Earth will survive, but how we humans fit in. Near the end of his life, H.G. Wells, who produced optimistic visions in the shape of things to come and the time machine, turned pessimist and wrote, Mind at the end of its tether. There is no way out or round or through, he said. Life on Earth." may not be ending, but humans aren't going anywhere. Yes, very dark. But compared with that kind of forecast, a new dark age starts to sound almost hopeful, like a fresh start. This has been the People's Republic. Until next time, or the end times, this is Greg Guma.